Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is doing great. My name is Charles. I'm a uh, communication project uh, officer here at the FNQLSDI. I'm here with Hassan Farah, geologist. Hello. He has uh, 30 years, of, over 30 years of experience. She has worked with big mine companies. She spent a lot of time in the field and she's developed quite an expertise in uh, 3D modeling. Uh, so today is the launch of our webinar series that will cover uh, geology and mining. So it's the first of 12 webinars. Today we're going to focus specifically on geology. A uh, few housekeeping rules before we get this thing going. First, if you don't mind muting your microphones, it would be greatly appreciated for uh, everyone's experience uh, during the webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to type them in the chat box to your right. They'll be covered at the end of the webinar. Uh, moreover, we'll uh, spare some 10, 15 minutes at the end of the webinar. So if you want to ask some questions directly via uh, audio uh, to Francine, we'll, uh, we'll do that as well. So that, that'll be really interesting. Um, last but not least, uh, all all 12 webinars will be uh, made readily available on uh, FNLQL SDI's website. Um, we may very well release the whole series all at once. So make sure you tune in every, uh, the, the next installment will be on February uh, 13th. So that'll be roughly two weeks from now. And stay tuned, but if ever, if you miss one, the whole thing will be made available for you online. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, introduce you to Hansen Parada. Hello. I'll let you take it from Thank here. You. Thank you. Hey, voilà. here we go. So uh, welcome to the Exploring Geosciences uh, thematics. Uh, today is uh, lesson one, introduction to geology. So, this, okay, so lesson one, uh, thematic one for block one is, uh, here's the overview of the three lessons. Uh, lesson one is introduction to geology. Lesson two is rocks and minerals. And lesson three is the rock formation. So lesson one is gonna be subdivided into um, three subjects, mainly this, the first uh, hour is, um, geological concepts and they're going to be um, covered with theory and some videos. So the lesson is divided into earth formation covering the geological eras and cycles and the tectonic plates, so the continental drifts, earthquakes, volcanism and mountain ranges. And the final hour is going to be the geology of Quebec, so the geological provinces, their characteristics and the quaternary geology. So to start with the geological eras, um, the geological time scale is here to cover several questions to place in time major events. Uh, some of these events can be the appearance, uh, disappearance of dinosaurs, uh, appearance of birds, humans, how life began on Earth, um, and how was our planet formed and populated by living things. So these questions, uh, the scientists with their studies of the uh, layers in the rocks and what they found in the rocks, they were able to define a um, special timeline that is called geological time scale. Uh, the geological time scale is broken into larger and smaller subdivisions. We can see them here. Um, the oldest uh, at the bottom going to the youngest. So these time scales were subdivided into eras and periods. And on the, on the right, we can see the main major events for these time scales. So uh, the oldest time scales here with the unicellulars um, um, organisms, followed by fishes, uh, reptiles, the appearance of plants and trees and the carboniferous and then the long periods of dinosaurs through the mammals and the humans in the quaternary. So this is the exact subdivisions of these eras, periods, and epochs. 
Um, we have here a fun little image that represents the Earth history on the 24 hours clock. So if we go uh, clockwise, we have first the beginning, the formation of the Earth, which is 4.5 billion years ago, followed by the appearance of the formation of the rocks, organisms, uh, around 4.3 billion years ago, followed by the first fungi and small plants, uh, roughly around uh, uh, 1.3 million years ago. And then you have the first appearance of fish, insects, and reptiles around 600 million years ago, followed by larger plants and trees around 475 million years ago. And then you have a long period between 245 million years to 65, uh, with uh, all the uh, evolutions through the um, different uh, families of the dinosaurs. And the last 65 million years is the appearances of all the mammals and through uh, the end, the human being. So the geological time scale is based mainly on the fossils uh, found into the rock formations, which are um, radioactive data. We're going to go see a little video that sums uh, the geological time scales. Your life can be divided into major stages like childhood, your adult years, and your later years. And each of those stages can be divided into divisions like infancy, teenage years, middle years, and so forth. Geologists have done something similar with the history of the Earth. They've created the geologic record, a standard time scale that partitions the Earth's history into four eons and their subdivisions of eras, periods, and epochs. Let's go over these eons and their important subdivisions and events. Why don't we enter a time machine and travel back to the first eon? As we dial in the year, negative 4.6 billion years ago, we step out of the machine into a hellish scene. The first eon, called the Hadean, lasted from the origin of the Earth, roughly 4.6 billion years ago, and ended about 4 billion years ago. At this point in time, the Earth was very hot and had a partially molten surface. It was like hell on Earth, almost literally, hence the name Hadean, which comes from Hades, the ancient Greek god of the underworld. The Hadean time is not a true geologic period because, with the exception of meteorites, there were no rocks on Earth at the time. Since I don't like hot weather and because the concept of Hades scares me, let's jump back into our time machine and travel to negative 4 billion years from today. As we step out of the time machine this time around, no pun intended, we start to suffocate because there is so little oxygen in the atmosphere. We're now in the second eon, the Archean eon, where the Earth cooled enough for the continental plates and rocks to form, but had an atmosphere composed of gases toxic to most life forms of today. The Archean eon started 4 billion years ago and ended 2.5 billion years ago. During this time, life came into existence, but the only life around was that of prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotes are single-celled organisms that do not have a membrane-bound nucleus or organelles. So, the likes of bacteria are prokaryotes. Since the Hadean is too hot and the Archean eon has nothing for us to breathe, I don't want to stick around here for long either. Let's get back into the time machine and travel to the third eon, the Proterozoic. To get to this eon, we have to dial the machine to negative 2.5 billion years, since it started about 2.5 billion years ago and ended roughly 542 million years ago. As we leave the time machine this time around, we can breathe a bit better because the concentration of atmospheric oxygen increased quite a bit. It's also a more interesting time because eukaryotic cells have appeared. These are cells that have a nucleus and organelles contained within membranes. These are the cells that make up our own body. It is during this eon that we also notice that algae and soft-bodied invertebrate animals appear on Earth. This is all very exciting, but all the cool stuff appears a bit later. So let's get back into the time machine one last time, to a time roughly 542 million years ago, the start of the fourth and present eon, the Phanerozoic. 
The Phanerozoic Eon is divided into three eras, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, with each one lasting roughly hundreds of millions of years. And each one of these eras is further subdivided into periods like the Cambrian, Jurassic, or Neogene, to give a few examples. These periods last roughly tens of millions of years each. The periods are further divided into epochs lasting about a few million to tens of millions of years each. Let's walk around a bit from our time machine to see what happens during the Phanerozoic Eon. During the Paleozoic Era, we notice the appearance of many different fungi, plants, and animals. This includes vascular plants, fish, insects, reptiles, and amphibians. Around 250 million years ago, at the start of the Mesozoic Era, cone-bearing plants, that is to say gymnosperms, are all over the place, and the dinosaurs evolve, while little mammals also appear. Flowering plants appeared towards the end of this era, and then about 65 million years ago, all the dinosaurs become extinct. It is about 65 million years ago that the current era, the Cenozoic or Cenozoic, begins. Mammals and birds begin to dominate the Earth after the dinosaurs become extinct. Flowering plants, or angiosperms, start dominating the Earth as well. Primates appear, and the first ancestors of us, humans, also come into existence. The Ice Age occurs in this era as well. And because we're already here today, in the Holocene epoch of the Quaternary period of the Cenozoic era of the Phanerozoic Eon, we don't have to take our time machine anywhere anymore. We can just pack up and go home. Okay, so if we continue. So the next one is uh, the geological cycle, uh, geological process and their map expressions. So we have here again in the clockwise uh, ways, the major events that form the geological cycle. So you have the erosion and transport uh, followed by the position of sediments, bur their burial and compaction. So uh, creating the sedimentary rocks followed by the deformation of and metamorphism of these same rocks. So they will be transformed into metamorphic rocks. Then going down into uh, the magma chambers, you have the melting, uh, the rocks infusion. So you have either the formation of the volcanoes and the pushing upwards of the material creates the mountains or the mountain ranges. And you have the crystallization of the magma going up, forming those igneous rocks. And the rock cycle finishes with the weathering of the rocks at the surface, being eroded, transported by the wind, water, um, gravity, and so on. And the cycle repeats itself. So if we take each step one at a time, for the deposition and the erosion, the first cycle here and here, so the deposition, you have like the geological process uh, where the rocks, soil, and silt are naturally deposited in such a way that the new land masses are created or old landforms are added to or changed. So as you add material to it, the erosion is, going part, is an ongoing part of any geological cycles as where the land is worn away and carried elsewhere by wind, rain, and gravity. The volcanic eruption and deposition here, um, you, can, you can see that there are few undersea volcanoes that grow big enough to become islands, but most become mountain ranges, as we can see here on the top of the seafloor, uh, where the tectonic plates that make up the Earth's crust spread apart and or crash together, that we'll see later on. Um, so the magma from beneath the ocean uh, floor oozes up forms new land in the spaces where the tectonic plates pull apart. And this is called seafloor spreading. Volcanoes above ground spew ash and dust. And this, again, is taken away with the weathering and the erosion and transport and put back into the cycle and, and so on. The water and ice deposition, they play a major role too. Water is in the form of either river, rivers, waves, ice, and they have the power to move sediments, sometimes hundreds of uh, kilometers away. The rivers move sediments a great distance, 
um, emptying oceans, lakes, and other rivers. Uh, glaciers will uh, move slowly, but they will transport uh, uh, huge material and to several kilometers. And finally, the ocean waves also play major roles into the geological cycle by transforming the coasts uh, slowly but truly. The most of the Earth's coasts are transformed by the ocean's waves, um, creating st steep cliffs and uh, sandy beaches. Uh, finally, you have the cycle that is influenced by wind and gravity. So everything that has to do with sand dunes, uh, landslides, mud flows um, are also formed and cause the process of deposition. So a good example would be sand dunes as a result of large amounts of sand moved by wind over time. Uh, also the force of gravity, gravity is enough to move sediments. Um, the, mass of, the mass movement of sediments occurs rapidly through landslides uh, of rock and soil, and mud flows of rock, soil, and water. So slower mass movements of land are aptly named creeps, but often involve the same types of materials. So a little video to summarize these concepts. On November 14, 1963, fishermen off the southern coast of Iceland noticed a new island had suddenly appeared where they fished. The small island was soon named Surtsey, which is Icelandic for Surtur's Island. Surtur, the Norse ruler of fire, is a fitting namesake. Surtsey was formed from a volcano on the sea floor, called a seamount, which had grown so big it broke the surface of the ocean and became an island. Surtsey continued to erupt for over three years and now provides a young island for scientists to discover all they can about new land. Surtsey is not the only new island. A 2006 eruption created a small island, Home Reef, near Tonga in the southern Pacific Ocean. Additionally, Mauna Loa and Kilauea on Hawaii's Big Island both continue to erupt, adding acres of land each year to the island. Nearby, the underwater volcano Loihi is just short of becoming another Hawaiian island. This process of island formation is a type of deposition, or the geological process whereby rocks, soil, and silt are naturally deposited in such a way that new land masses are created or old landforms are added to or changed. During erosion, which is part of the geologic cycle, land is worn away and carried elsewhere by elements like wind and rain. Rock and tiny pieces of rock called silt are carried away to make up sediment. Of course, all that rock and silt, or sediment, has to go somewhere. Sometimes deposition is as dramatic as the creation of a new island, but it often affects much smaller incremental changes in land that, over time, can become new landforms like mountains and river deltas. While a few undersea volcanoes grow big enough to become islands, most become mountain ranges on the sea floor, where the tectonic plates that make up the Earth's crust spread apart and or crash together. Magma from beneath the ocean floor oozes up to form new land in the spaces where tectonic plates pull apart through a process called seafloor spreading. In addition to lava, volcanoes above ground spew ash and dust which settle near the volcano itself, but also get picked up by the wind or are pushed far out by the force of the blast. The ash, dust, and pieces of volcanic rock then settle and become a part of the existing landscape. The bigger the eruption, the more deposits that are added. For example, when Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, so much dust and ash was released that roofs of houses collapsed under the weight. Fields of crops were destroyed, and the land was left unusable for many years. Water in the form of rivers, waves, and ice has the power to move sediment, sometimes hundreds of miles. Rivers move sediment great distances, emptying it into oceans, lakes, and even other rivers. Sometimes the deposits get washed, and sometimes, as is the case with the slow-moving Mississippi River, the sediment steadily builds up and creates deltas. 
Luckily for people, deltas provide fertile soil for agriculture and ideal areas for fishing and shipping. Glaciers seem like a slow way to travel. However, they can pick up and move rocks and soil hundreds of miles away from where they started. This provides hours of fun for geologists when they try to figure out how a rock the size of a car ended up so far from where it belongs. When a glacier melts, the embedded rock and other materials can be left anywhere along the glacier's path, forming deposits called moraines. Ocean waves are also powerful forces. Just think of the kind of power needed to shape coasts. Waves don't strike at once the way volcanoes and landslides can, but over time they create steep cliffs and sandy beaches. Sand dunes, landslides, and mudflows are also formed and or caused by the process of deposition. A sand dune is the result of large amounts of sand moved by the wind over time. Found in coastal areas and deserts where sand is plentiful, there is no set size or shape for a constantly moving sand dune. However, they can grow as high as 1,640 feet, as they do in parts of northern China. Sometimes, the sheer force of gravity is enough to move sediment. The mass movement of sediment occurs rapidly through landslides of rock and soil and mudflows of rock, soil, and water. Slower mass movements of land are aptly named creeps, but often involve the same types of materials. If we continue um, with the tectonic plates, continental drift, so uh, to keep things simple, the image here on the top shows the Pangaea, uh, the supercontinent before it was separated 250 million years ago. And the picture down here shows the actual position of the continents nowadays. So the tectonic plates is also defined with a cycle. It's called the Wilson cycle. Um, and it describes the opening clo and closing of an ocean basin by the continental drift. So you have the steps here uh, clockwise. So A would represent a stable crust, a supercontinent before it opens. Uh, opening is called the continental rift, uh, followed by the oceanic expansion, the uh, oceanic um, collision, uh, subduction, sorry, the oceanic closure, continental collision, and the erosion and penetration. So each of these steps um, are described here, and then later on we'll see in the words in the crust what happens. So A is uh, simply a supercontinent that is uh, in one piece, uh, example here the Pangaea formed, um, and while it breaks on the step B uh, along the continental rift, so it's called the continental rift, drift, sorry, um, followed by the oceanic expansion at sea. So it's where the formation of the seas and the oceans, followed by the subduction of the oceanic crust beneath the continents, as shown in D. In E, we see uh, how this uh, oceanic closure is going on as the plates go towards each other. So decreasing the size of the ocean. Then in F, we have a collisions between the continents leading to the formation of the mountain ranges. And this process is called orogenesis. Um, and finally in J, we have the creation of the supercontinent followed by the assembly of the continents and so on. And that's how it repeats. So each step for, okay, the beginning of a continental rift, we see here at the top, we have one continent at the bottom here. Inside, we can see an example of a magma chamber convection with the heat and the fissures where the magma can go rise and creating the volcanoes, what we call hotspots. Then we have the continental rift with volcanism. So these rifts are creating stair-like stair um, geometries, and we have the volcanism still going on. It's followed by the formation of an oceanic crust and a linear uh, sea. So as the continents are drifting from one, one, uh, from one to the other, um, and it would be an example of how the Atlantic Ocean formed. 
once uh, we're here in the subductions, uh, these oceanic crust one will be subducted under the, the one coast example here. So we have the examples of how the magma chambers are forming the volcanoes and how the sediments um, prisons are created under the sea. And then we have the collision of these uh, continents. So once these continents um, collide in the middle part, there is an uplift of the material creating the uh, mountain ranges. And the last step, once these mountain ranges undergo erosion and penetration, the top parts at the summits of the mountains are um, cut off and the cycle repeats itself. So to show a concrete example of the plate tectonics and its definition. Imagine a nice hot summer day. You've just poured yourself a tall glass of lemonade and are watching how the chunks of ice are clinking against each other. As you take that first refreshing sip, you feel a little rumble in the ground beneath your feet. The earthquake only lasts for a second, but it's enough for a bit of your lemonade to spill out on the table. The ice clamors against the other cubes for the few seconds of the tremor. Your lemonade and that earthquake have more in common than you might think. Just as you were watching the ice cubes collide in your glass, the whole surface of the earth floats in a molten layer of melted rock known as the mantle. The mantle is about the consistency of a milkshake, which is ironic as it's so hot that putting it in a cup would be painful, much less drinking it. The world's crust, the part we live on, floats on top of this in a number of large chunks known as plates. We call this idea that the world's surface is indeed a collection of plates the theory of plate tectonics. It's still a theory because we have no way of proving it with absolute certainty. However, gravity is also a theory, and we're just as sure of it existing as we are of plate tectonics existing. Both of these theories, like all theories, have been subject to the process of the scientific method and are more than just a wild guess. As a result of these plates, the world's surface actually is more like a soccer ball, with each panel rubbing against the others. The places where these plates rub against each other are called faults. Now before you get scared, these faults are not cliffs to the center of the earth. However, when there is an earthquake, chances are you would not want to be near one. This is because places near faults often experience the most damage because earthquakes are the result of tectonic plate movement. Also, note that the plates are not all of equal size. Some are rather large, like the Pacific Plate or the North American Plate. Others are very small, like the Juan de Fuca Plate off the west coast of the United States. When you pick up your glass of lemonade, you shake around the ice cubes and make them move. For the Earth, it's a bit different, but really much the same. Imagine that if you had ice cubes that wouldn't melt. Now imagine that you put your lemonade over a heat source and boiled it. Better yet, probably best to use someone else's lemonade. In any event, the bubbling of the heat would cause the ice cubes to move even before the lemonade boiled. The same is happening under the Earth's surface. Here there is a process known as thermal convection. Thermal convection happens when hot mantle from close to the core rises to the crust. In some places, with plenty of volcanoes, like Iceland and Yellowstone National Park, this heat source is close enough that it warms up hot springs and geysers. Just like the ice cubes in your drink, this heat causes the plates to move. Also, the movement of other plates can create underground vacuums that suck a plate into a new position. Scientists use precise terms to describe this movement so that everyone knows exactly what is happening. If a fault line exists where two plates are moving away from one another, we call it a divergent boundary. Conversely, if a fault line exists where two plates are moving against each other, we call it a convergent boundary. This is where things can get interesting. If a plate is pushed under another plate, it will form a line of volcanoes. If two plates just push up against each other, with both going up, it will form really tall mountains, like the Himalayas. Finally, transform boundaries exist when two plates rub up against each other, with one moving in one direction and the other moving in the opposite direction. The good news is that there won't be any volcanoes or mountains develop. 
The bad news is that this causes many earthquakes. The San Andreas Fault in California is a transform boundary. In 1912, when Alfred Wegener proposed that the continents had once been joined together and had split apart, the biggest weakness in his hypothesis was the lack of a mechanism that would allow continents to move through ocean basins. At the time, everyone believed the oceans were permanent features, and at the time of Wegener, there was no credible explanation for a way the continents could have plowed through the rocks of the seafloor. But in 1962, a geologist and U.S. Navy Reserve Rear Admiral named Harry Hess came up with an answer. Rather than plowing through seafloor rocks, Hess proposed that it was the seafloor itself that was pushing the continents apart. He believed that the location and topography of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge was not coincidence. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is an ocean ridge found along the Atlantic Ocean floor. The ridge, he thought, was where new seafloor was being added to the Earth's lithosphere, the outermost layer of the Earth, which in turn pushed the continents apart. Hess called it seafloor spreading. Harry Hess proposed that new seafloor crust was continually formed at mid-ocean ridges. Hess argued that the mid-Atlantic ridge was a boundary where two lithospheric plates were rifting or being pulled apart. As that happened, rising magma, or molten rock, from the upper part of the mantle filled in the cracks that formed in the Earth's crust. After the magma solidified into basalt, an igneous rock, Additional rifting pulled those rocks apart, too. In effect, Hess proposed the existence of a magma-driven conveyor belt that continually added new seafloor very slowly over time, widening the Atlantic Ocean basin and pushing apart the continents to either side. So, rather than plowing through seafloor rocks, Hess proposed that it was the seafloor itself that was pushing the continents apart. It was an insightful hypothesis, but was there any evidence to confirm Hess's idea, or would he suffer the same criticisms that Wegener had endured? Not long after Hess published his ideas, other scientists published their measurements of the magnetic properties of Atlantic Ocean seafloor basalt, or the seafloor magnetism. They had discovered an unexpected pattern preserved in the rocks. As new seafloor basalt is added over time, it records the pattern of reversals in the polarity of the magnetic field. When igneous rocks like basalt crystallize, the iron atoms in them align with the magnetic field of the Earth. Geologists were aware that the north-south magnetic polarity of the Earth's magnetic field had reversed on occasion, but in the seafloor basalt, the researchers found a pattern of repeated magnetic field reversals, preserved in bands of basalt running parallel to the axis of the mid-Atlantic ridge. More important to Hess's hypothesis, the pattern repeated in a mirror image on opposite sides of the ridge. The only possible explanation was that new basalt rocks were constantly forming and moving away from ocean ridges in opposite directions, preserving in them the polarity changes of the magnetic field. Additional confirmation of Hess's mechanism came later as radiometric age dating was used to determine ages of seafloor basalt. Radiometric age dating is a technique scientists use to determine how long ago materials, such as rock, were formed. The seafloor rocks on the Mid-Atlantic Range were only a few million years old, while those closest to the continents were about 200 million years old. It was determined that the seafloor basalt is youngest at mid-ocean ridges and oldest adjacent to continents. Seafloor spreading had been proved. Harry Hess was right, and Alfred Wegener was vindicated. So we're going to move on with uh, the formation of the earthquakes. So earthquakes are simplified as ground shaking, um, but that's a simple definition, but it's, of course it's more complex than that. Uh, basically, as we can see here on the right, we have uh, on the surface, uh, surface line, we have a fault underground and what we call a focus um, point. Focus point is where the earthquake uh, forms, initiates, and if we go directly up of the focus point, it's called the epicenter, and it's the point on Earth where we can feel the strongest uh, the uh, earthquakes shaking. So the rocks uh, deep underground are squeezed and tightly, tightly together along the fracture, which is the fault. And this is where the natural process of these uh, plates move and keeps uh, friction on each other, creating some stress. 
Um, so the stress is relieved and that's what we call the elastic rebound and that's what, what creates the seismic waves, so, which is called focus. So this is used to determine the earthquake occurrences and seismic waves rise to the Earth's surface and right at the surface it's called the epicenter. So this epicenter is the central point from where all of the ground is shaking and it extends outward on the surface. So it usually reflects the most damage from an earthquake. Um, most earthquakes uh, don't uh, only have one shock, they have four shocks and aftershocks. So they can have uh, several episodes. Earthquakes are one of the most dangerous natural disasters on Earth. This is because they strike with little or no warning and can cause catastrophic damage. All that shaking comes from deep underground, but as you know, the surface shakes a lot too, which is where all the damage occurs. Buildings fall down, roads and bridges collapse, and land and mud come sliding down from hillsides. But what causes all that shaking in the first place? Earthquakes happen deep underground along tectonic plate boundaries. Tectonic plates are what make up the Earth's crust, its outermost layer. These plates fit together like puzzle pieces, but they don't stay in one place. They're always moving because the part of the Earth underneath them is like a fluid. And because the plates are sitting on top of this fluid like ice on top of a pond, they are not locked in place and are sort of floating about. However, each plate is lined up pretty well with the other plates around it. So as they move, they create tension and pressure as they slide past and bump into each other, sometimes even sticking together. And though the plate boundary is stuck, the plate itself keeps moving and pulling the rest of the plate with it. Eventually, the pulling becomes too much and the plates suddenly break free from each other, causing an earthquake. The place where the bumping and sliding occurs along the plate boundaries is called a fault. Plate boundaries can have many faults, and most of the world's earthquakes occur along plate boundaries for this reason. The Ring of Fire is an area where most of the world's earthquakes occur because it lines up with many of the plate boundaries. The San Andreas Fault in California is one of the most famous because it runs much of the length of the state and is very active. California's many earthquakes are a result of this dynamic plate boundary. Imagine it like this. You're playing a game of tug of war with your friend and you're both pulling pretty hard on the rope from each end. Suddenly, your friend lets go of the other side of the rope. All of the tension quickly leaves the rope and you go tumbling down to the ground. The release of energy during an earthquake is very much the same. The plates get stuck, building up tension. Suddenly, the tension releases and both plates break free. The tension that was built up gets sent through the ground, which is what causes all the shaking in the first place. Scientists now know that the movement of the faults is what causes the ground to shake, but it was previously thought that the opposite was true, that the ground shaking caused faults to slip. The theory of elastic rebound explains that faults slip during an earthquake and cause ground shaking. This theory explains what you've just learned, that the plates keep moving even though the part stuck along the fault does not, which causes a sudden slip along the fault when it finally breaks free. The theory also explains what happens to the land around the fault once it does slip. The ground slowly gets deformed as it sticks and then rebounds back into shape once it breaks free. You fall on the ground when your friend lets go of the rope because all that built up tension has to escape somewhere. The tension built up from a slipping fault also needs an outlet once the tension is released, but this gets sent through the earth as waves of energy known as seismic waves. There are two different types of seismic waves, body waves and surface waves. Body waves are seismic waves that travel through the ground under Earth's surface, and surface waves are seismic waves that travel through Earth's surface. Makes sense, right? Body waves occur in Earth's body, while surface waves occur on the surface. When an earthquake occurs, the seismic waves radiate out in all directions from the focus, which is where the earthquake occurred underground. You can think of this as the focal point of the earthquake, where all the action starts. Body waves, which are the fastest seismic waves, begin to travel from deep underground. As the waves reach the surface and become surface waves, they're not traveling as fast, but they do inflict the most damage. 
Directly above the focus on the surface is the epicenter, which you can think of as the center of the earthquake on the surface. Radiating out from the epicenter, surface waves move the ground up and down and side to side, which is what causes all the damage an earthquake produces. Moving on to the volcanoes. So volcano is, uh, is a vent, a vent in the Earth's crust where the uh, uh, lava, rock, and fragments, hot vapor, and gases are ejected. Uh, volcano begins to form when magma, which is the hot molten rocks at the, in the magma chamber uh, from deep within the earth, rises toward the earth's surfaces and collects in magma chambers. Um, the magma chamber is a chamber that holds, has pressure that builds within these chambers and uh, the magma is expelled through vents or fissures in the Earth's surfaces as volcanic eruption. So what we call magma is only uh, referring to liquid rocks in the middle of the Earth within the magma chambers and what, what is called lava has to be a liquid rock that's leaving the Earth, so being ejected. The volcanoes have been classified into three categories. You, we have the active volcanoes, which um, have to have erupted at least once in the past 10,000 years. There are many active volcanoes uh, along the tectonic plates, uh, which in theory uh, states the Earth's crust is broken into plates. Um, these plate-like sections of crust are called tectonic plates, as we've seen, and they, are, they mark the major boundaries between the plates, magma, where can escape in volcanic eruptions. We have the uh, dormant volcanoes, which have not erupted in the past 10,000 years, but have the potential to erupt in the near future. Um, and finally, the extinct volcanoes, which uh, we don't expect to erupt again. Volcanoes are spectacular events, and because of this, they have found their way into the plot of many Hollywood movies. While the movies have given most of us the vivid image of red-hot lava spewing out of the top of a towering volcano, they do not share the entire story of volcanoes. In this lesson, we will fill in some of the blanks left by Hollywood as we learn how volcanoes form and why eruptions occur. So what exactly is a volcano? Well, it can be defined as a vent in the Earth's crust through which lava, rock fragments, hot vapor, and gases are ejected. In other words, a volcano is the Earth's way of letting off a little steam. The superheated particles that eject out of a volcano come from deep below the Earth's surface where temperatures can become so hot that rock actually melts. Magma is the term used to describe this hot molten rock from deep within the Earth. A volcano begins to form when magma, which is less dense than the rock it originated from, rises toward the Earth's surface. This liquid rock collects in chambers called magma chambers, where pressure builds due to expanding steam and gases associated with the magma. As pressure reaches a peak within these chambers, magma finds its way through a vent or fissure in the Earth's surface resulting in a volcanic eruption and the expulsion of the hot molten rock. We now have hot molten rock outside of a volcano and its name changes from magma to lava. So you can think of magma as liquid rock in the middle of the Earth and lava as liquid rock that's leaving the Earth. When a volcano erupts, it expels lava, gases, and rocks with tremendous force. It's no wonder that the Romans thought that volcanoes were the work of the gods. The name volcano comes from a little island in the Mediterranean Sea called Volcano. Centuries ago, people in the area thought that the island was a chimney that led out of Vulcan's workshop. Vulcan was the blacksmith for the Roman gods, and when lava and ash would spew from the mountain, it was a sign that Vulcan was hard at work pounding out weapons for the gods. Now, volcanoes are classified by their level of activity. If a volcano is deemed to be an active volcano, then it is a volcano that has erupted at least once in the past 10,000 years. Now, as you can see, there's a pretty big window for active volcanoes. With this definition, an active volcano could be erupting right now or might have erupted only once since the last ice age.
There are about 1,500 active volcanoes on planet Earth, and this includes those under the world's oceans. You might think it's odd that a fiery volcano could erupt under tons of ocean water, but this is because many active volcanoes, both underwater and on land, occur due to plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is a theory that states the Earth's crust is broken up into pieces. With plate tectonics, we see that the outer crust of the Earth is actually cracked, much like the fractures that happen when you crack the shell of a hard-boiled egg. The resulting plate-like sections of crust are called tectonic plates, and they float on top of the much hotter deep layers of the Earth, sort of like a hockey puck glides over an air hockey table. Openings at the plate boundaries where these plates meet each other allow hot molten magma to escape in a volcanic eruption, even if these plate boundaries are underwater. Not all volcanoes occur along plate boundaries, but many of the world's most active volcanoes are in these locations. For example, the Ring of Fire is an area of the Pacific Ocean Basin that is tectonically active due to the presence of plate boundaries. This area is home to many active volcanoes, including Mount St. Helens, which erupted in 1980 in Washington State. It was the most destructive volcano eruption in the United States history. If a volcano is not active, it could be a dormant volcano, which means that it is a volcano that has not erupted in the past 10,000 years, but has the potential to erupt in the future. Mount Rainier, which is also located in Washington State, is an example of a dormant volcano. At a height of over 14,000 feet, Mount Rainier can be considered a sleeping giant that keeps volcanologists on their toes. A volcano can also be classified as an extinct volcano, which means that it is a volcano that is not expected to erupt again. These past volcanoes no longer have a lava supply and therefore are deemed unlikely hotspots for volcanic activity. In 2013, researchers discovered the world's largest volcano lying quietly at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. It is estimated that this 400-mile-wide volcano last erupted about 144 million years ago and has been extinct ever since. The final um, concept will be the mountains, how the mountain ranges are formed. So as we've seen the tectonic plates here of the Earth, you can see uh, all along their um, intersection lines is where we have the most movements and collisions. And this is where uh, the uplifting of the material creates mountains uh, or, and mountain ranges. So you have three uh, types, either volcanic, domes and folded mountains, and fault mountains. So volcanic mountains, it says in the world, you can have the, those mountains form through the, the volcanism. The folded mountains are range, uh, mountains ranges are created when the subduction zones are uh, ongoing and uplifting the material to create a series of uh, mountain range. And here uh, on the right, you have the formation of block fault block mountains. You have the normal faults. You have the center part going up and uplifting the material and creating the fault block mountains. So examples here of these uh, different types of mountain ranges. So the volcanic, as we saw, the Mount St. Helens, um, the dome here as uh, Bear Butte in South Dakota, the faulted mountains here as example as the Him Himalayas and the uh, fault block as an example in the Seria Sierra Nevada mountains in North America. So this again is uh, um, a flat picture of the earth and the major mountain ranges that we have. So in Canada, Quebec, near Quebec is the Appalachian, which goes down to the southeast towards the United States. We have out in the west, the Rockies that start in, the, uh, in Alaska going down to um, uh, New Mexico. You have on the um, western coast Sierra Nevada and the Sierra Madre and of course the Andes all along the South America. Um, other knowns worldwide are the Atlas in the northern part of Africa, uh, the Pyrenees and Les Alpes in Europe, the Scandinavian mountains 
and of course the Himalayas and the Great Dividing Range in Australia. So one of the final videos, all these concepts are going to be used for the other half of the lesson to go through the geology of Quebec. A mountain range is a group or chain of mountains located close together. Since neighboring mountains often share the same geological origins, mountain ranges have a similar form, size, and age. Think of them like a neighborhood of houses, all built around the same time. While they are not identical, they share similar features and are similar in their overall square footage. One well-known mountain range is the Himalayas Range in Asia. It was created when pieces of the Earth's crust, called tectonic plates, crashed into each other several million years ago. Many of the tallest mountains in the world, including the world's tallest, Mount Everest, are part of the Himalayas. The longest mountain range in the world, the Mid-Ocean Ridge, is one we cannot see. That is because 90% of it is covered by the ocean. The Mid-Ocean Ridge extends for 65,000 kilometers, or 40,389 miles, which is quite a distance if you consider that the Appalachian Mountains, spanning from the American South to Canada, is 2,414 kilometers, or 1,500 miles long. Mountains are landforms that rise high above the natural formations around them. A mountain's height above sea level is called its elevation, with its highest point called a summit or peak. Geologists, it turns out, don't readily agree what height makes a mountain a mountain, but an elevation of 300 meters, or 1,000 feet, is generally high enough to earn the classification. Mount Everest, located in the country of Nepal, rises 8,850 meters, or 29,035 feet above sea level, which makes it the world's highest point. Long chains of mountain ranges combine to form mountain belts. Mountain belts extend for several hundred kilometers, often across continents. The Andes Mountains span seven South American countries and are a result of the Pacific tectonic plate colliding with the South American plate. You have probably heard of some of the major American mountain belts, including the Rocky Mountains in the western part of the United States and the Appalachians on the east coast. The Rocky Mountains may be known for their high, sharp peaks, but the shorter, rounder Appalachian Mountains are the older of the two belts. Wind, rain, and other elements have weathered the Appalachians over millions of years, making them a sort of mellower, older brother to the Rockies. The Appalachian Belt serves as the Eastern Continental Divide, an imaginary line that decides which direction water will drain, either to the east or the west. The Appalachians are made up of many smaller ranges, including the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, the Alleghenies of Pennsylvania, and the Catskills in New York. The Rocky Mountains extend over 4,830 kilometers, or 3,000 miles, from New Mexico in the U.S. to British Columbia in Canada. As a mountain belt, the Rockies contain several smaller ranges, including the Tetons, the Wyoming, and the Bear River Mountains. The Rocky Mountains are home to the Western Continental Divide. So, the concepts, all the concepts are covered for the next uh, other half of the lesson. So this is just an image of the Earth flattened and showing all the uh, plate tectonics uh, as explained in the prior part of the lesson. So if we move on, here is the world's uh, tectonic plates with all the geological provinces and how they appear. So Quebec is situated here and you can see that within the country, um, these geological provinces are continuous. If we go to the geological province of Canada, um, in orange we see the superior province and we can see that it covers a large part of Quebec but continues to the west throughout Ontario and it covers a part also of uh, Manitoba. Um, the other the other provinces, I'm going to show uh, zooming in Quebec. So here on the left, we have the complete geological map of Quebec, which is um, described and typical, uh, separated within seven geological provinces. These um, geological provinces are shown here, the youngest one at the top going down to the oldest one superior. 
So if we start with the youngest one here, um, the St. Lawrence platform covers here and the Anticosti Island, uh, followed by the Hudson Bay platform here uh, on the left, uh, followed by the Appalachian, which goes down also to the States. Um, in between the Appalachian and the Superior, we find the uh, Grenville province, where we have uh, Bicomo, uh, Setsil, and uh, Pisane. Uh, the Superior province covers most of Quebec, and within, we'll see a, a, in the next slide, the Superior has also been subdivided into seven sub provinces. And finally, we have the Churchill and the night. So just to make a link between what we just uh, learned between what happened uh, worldwide uh, during the tectonic plates, and we'll see what happened also within the Quebec province. So we start with the old continental margin, which is shown here in the bold dark line, which is the limit between the Superior and the Churchill. So it coincides with the continental rift formation of the uh, Mani K1 ocean, roughly between 1900 to 2100 million years ago, uh, and corresponds to the closing of the Mani K1 ocean. So it's the formation of the New Quebec Fonts uh, du Labrador and uh, the Ungava orogenesis here around 1800 and 1900 million years. Then we move on to the superior Grenville suture, which we have here on this uh, bold line. So the evidence between the two is not known. Um, the formation of the or Grenvillian orogenesis is between uh, 1,000 and 1,100 million years ago. And, the, and it corresponds to the uh, assembly of the uh, supercontinent Rodinia. Going and following the tectonic plates, uh, we have here the suture of the uh, Grenville Appalachian, and this corresponds to the same time or epoch of the uh, Rodinia, the rifting of the Rodinia supercontinent into eight continents, and the uh, famous formation of the Iapetus Ocean roughly 600 million years ago. This corresponds to the closing of the Iapetus Ocean and the formation of uh, both Taconian and the Acadian uh, Appalachian mountain ranges that we can see here. And it also corresponds to the uh, assembly of the supercontinent, the Pangaea, between 450 and 200 million years. And finally here we have the actual margin of the Atlantic Ocean, which corresponds to the rifting of the uh, supercontinent, the Pangaea, in the seven continents that we have actually now, uh, and it corresponds to roughly 175 billion years ago. So now we're, we're going to move on to the characteristics of each provinces. First, I wanted to show um, an overview of the superior province. Here we have it draped on the topo relief for the Quebec province and to show the position of its seven sub province divisions. So if we start from the bottom, from the southwest part, we have the Abitibi region or sub province around the Val d'Or Hawaii area going up towards uh, Shibugamo area, we have what we call the Opat Opatica sub-province and the Opinaka and La Grande sub-province, including the Ashwanipi, which uh, forms uh, around the James Bay area. And then when we move upwards in the Great North uh, part of Quebec, we have the Bienville and the Minto sub-provinces of the Superior. So before going into their uh, rock geology, I just I just wanted to mention their potential, um, how each province um, show uh, exploration potential. So here we're going to start with the Superior Province, which is uh, contains rocks, volcanic rocks, roughly between uh, older than twenty seven 
100 million years ago. So as we can see, the sub-province here is subdivided and it is subdivided by its rock composition. So the Abitibi, which is green and yellow here, is mainly the volcano uh, sedimentary belt and the um, uh, Plutons, followed in blue by the meta sediments of the Opilaca and with the Plutonic rocks of the Bienville and the Inesic and Plutonic rocks of Ashwanipi and the Minto. And as you can see, these sub-provinces are also continuous and followed into uh, Ontario and uh, Manitoba. And we can see um, that they have been broken down with, with faults. So the major potentials here for our superior is gold, copper, zinc deposits. We can have magmatic rocks rich in nickel and platinum. We have the Algoma uh, iron formations and we have the uh, kimberlites uh, rich in diamonds uh, that are much younger than the volcanic rocks. If we move on to the uh, Churchill province in New Quebec and the Torngat, New Quebec and the Torngat areas, the main substances uh, which are explored here are iron, copper, nickel, the PGEs. PGEs are the uh, platinum group elements, I listed them here. Uh, gold, zinc, and cobalt. And in the Torngat area, uh, we have uranium, diamonds, copper, and the re. The re is the rare earth, rare earth elements. Uh, at the top of Quebec in the Nunavik, we have the geology of the Churchill province corresponding to the Cape Smith belt, uh, which is mainly explored for nickel, copper, cobalt, and the PGs. Uh, and in the recent years, uh, there has been uh, more and more gold exploration too. We have the position here of the Ragand mine. So going down uh, to the Grenville province, the Grenville province is mainly known for its industrial minerals as graphite, apatite, ilmenite, and aluminosilicates as garnet, cinnamonite, and kyanite. We have the position here of Setil, Bicomo, and the uh, Masson graphite mine is around this area. We also explore the Grenville province for metals as nickel, copper, and PG. For, so for the ages, as I stated before, in order, so here are their rough numbers. Um, so if we start with the youngest, the St. Lawrence platform, it's roughly between 430 and 570 million years, followed by the Hudson Bay platform, which is between 410 and 450 million years. Uh, we have the Appalachian between 300 and 600 million years followed by the Grenville, which is between 600 and 2,700 million years. Uh, the Churchill is between roughly 1,100 to 2,900 million years. And the Nape, Nape province is uh, between 1,300 and 3,800. And the Superior is placed as the oldest because the minimum limit is uh, above anything above 2,500. And it goes till um, 43, roughly 43 uh, hundred million years, where in, uh, in 201, an old, the oldest rock was found in the Inukjuak uh, region. So as you can see, the superior province here occupies uh, the central part of the Canadian shield uh, and occupy, occupies uh, half of Quebec province, which is roughly uh, uh, 750,000 square kilometers. It's mainly uh, made up of uh, old rocks from the Archean. The Abitibi sub-province is, is well known here, is the most extensive uh, Archean volcano sedimentary belt in the world. And it's uh, uh, very well known for its precious uh, metals as gold and base metals as uh, copper, zinc, uh, silver. 
followed by the Lane province, which is mainly located within the uh, Labrador near the Torngat Mountains. Um, most of it is within the Labrador uh, uh, area and only uh, roughly six, 60 square, kilom square kilometers are within the Quebec province. It is mainly made up of, made up of Archean metamorphic rocks. The Churchill province is located, as I said before, uh, within, uh, between the Quebec and the Labrador and within the uh, uh, Cape Smith uh, Belt area. So it covers roughly uh, 200,000 kil square kilometers and it, com it is uh, composed of various type of rocks between 1100 and 2900 million years. And it includes three distinct mountain ranges or orogenesis. In the Ungava area, we have the, um, here on top, we have the nickel copper deposits of Cape Smith. And in New Quebec, uh, in the western part, we have the massive iron deposits, as well as many copper, nickel, and PGEs. And finally, in the Torn Gats, we have um, rocks that were injected by kimberlites with uh, diamond potential. The uh, Grenville province um, covers by itself one third of Quebec and it extends uh, 6,000 kilometers from Mexico to Labrador to Scandinavia, as we can see here. Um, it consists mainly of uh, rocks uh, between the Archean and the Proterozoic uh, period. And it's mainly known for its iron and in minute mines for uh, industrial mineral potential. The Appalachian province here um, covers an area of uh, 80,000 square kilometers and extends 3,000 kilometers from Newfoundland to the south of the USA, as shown here. It's mostly composed of Paleozoic sedimentary rocks ranging from 300 to 600 million years. The mountain ranges are formed by two of the tectonic events, again, the Taconian and the Acadian. And one of the well-known mines in the Appalachian is the uh, Copper Gaspe mines. Uh, the St. Lawrence platform characteristics, as we can see here, is divided into two. We have one part here in between the Granville and the Appalachian and the Anticosti Island. So these two together, they cover roughly 30,000 square kilometers and overlies rocks of the Granville. Um, they were developed at the end of the Proterozoic and during the Paleozoic with the formation of the St. Lawrence Rift. And their main uh, composition or lithologies are uh, sedimentary limestones. Uh, finally, the Hudson Bay platform. It's a small too, and it's roughly uh, 5,500 uh, 5, square kilometers, and, and is uh, south of James Bay. And like the St. Lawrence platform, it is mainly composed of sedimentary rocks, uh, aging between 410 and 450 million years. This I'll skip for now, I'll go back at the end. So now we're gonna talk about the quaternary geology. Uh, first, how it affected the, the country, and then we'll move on to Quebec's quaternary geology. So, we had, um, during the quaternary period, we had a long cooling sequence, uh, which uh, we can see that we had an entire uh, glacier uh, covering the country, which was called the Inlensis Laurentian. And within the Western part, it was called the Inlensis de la Cordillère for the uh, BC part. You can see that it was going down a bit in the States. The arrow shows the movements, how it was going about. And as you can see, it was moving in all directions. As it was moving in all directions, it was scraping the earth and was 
uh, piling up with all kinds of materials and tra transporting it uh, several kilometers away. So these we're going to cover. So this last glaciation dates back to uh, roughly 21,000 years ago. Um, it completely covered the, the country, as I said. Its thickness was roughly uh, 4,000 uh, meters. And it's what really shaped the country with its erosions and sediment transportation. So what kind of transportation did it do is mostly by gravity. Um, all kinds of debris sizes uh, was incorporated at the base of the glacier. So it would erode the surface as you would think, uh, as if you had a sandpaper going on the top of a surface. So other fragments of rocks, bed rocks were torn off and the action of freezing and thawing of the water would uh, either transport the material or, or just uh, let it go and wherever the water was thawing. So two types of sediments that you can find. So they're either glacial, glacial sediments or glacial fluvial sediments. Glacial sediments are deposited directly by the ice and they're known as moraines or tills. Glacial fluvial sediments, they're redistributed by the meltwater of the glaciers. So they're either known as eskers or calves. So now if we move on to the quaternary geology of Quebec, what happened? It was roughly 1300, uh, 13,000 years ago. And the weight of the ice, with the weight of the ice, the earth's crust was collapsed uh, under the continental surface and uh, it was found in places to be below the sea level. So being below the sea level, um, we had the formation of the Champlain Sea. So this happened, we have evidence of the material uh, all over the St. Lawrence Lowlands, the Saguenay, Lac Saint-Jean region and the Gaspé North Shore coasts. We had the creation of the Champlain Sea with the Gulf La Flamme and the uh, Sea of uh, Gold Weight. So this evidence is found within the uh, glacial origin deposits, leaving behind deep sea uh, marine deposits like clays and coastal fine sand sediments. Elsewhere, we have evidence up north that we can't see here on the map, but in the Abitibi uh, Timiskaming region, uh, the Lake Ojibwe uh, left has traces of that sea uh, within the clays and the sands of the lakes. So this morning we had a good question about how long this uh, sea was uh, uh, within the Quebec area. So uh, it was roughly 3,000 years and it makes sense because when a human appeared it was around about 10,000 years. So it interests people. Here is just a, a diagram showing as the glacier is recessed, is the front is moving on, what happens behind as the glacier moved on. So first on the bottom we have the bedrock, which is of course covered, uh, automatically covered by tills. Um, and right behind the glacier we have what we call the progressional lakes, which are formed. These lakes afterwards are spreading around the plain, creating the rivers. The rivers are spreading to creating what we call the wetlands. These rivers, as they are farther and farther from the glacier, are going to form what we call the uh, deltas, and the del deltas are going to fall within the, the sea. And uh, underwater, we have the marine clays. Again, closer to the glacier, we have all kinds of deposits that are defined um, with the shapes of their um, formation. So we have the cans, the kettles, eskers, and the drumlins. We have the moraines, the wetlands, uh, the fluvial glacial sediments, we'll go see that, the dunes, the coastal dunes, and uh, the deltas. 
So uh, this is just to show what happened once this class C passed over. What happened is what we call, it's a return to the balance, which uh, has been established for thousands of years. So we know now it's 3000 years. Uh, following what we call the isostatic recovery, which is um, marine invasion such as the Champlain Sea, which has finally emptied, emptied itself within the St. Lawrence River. So examples of these deposits, uh, clear examples here are like the tills. Uh, the tills, they result from the transport of glacier and they are mainly composed of uh, torn rock rocks, which are loops deposits and we can see here and their size vary a lot. Uh, and they're fine in a fine matrix. Um, generally, all the grains of all sizes and they are not very permeable. The moraines, as we can see here uh, on the right, they form ridges of deposits composed of till, glacial sediments, uh, such as sands, gravels, and boulders, or a mixture of both. We have three types of moraines. We have the frontal, where the deposits are on its forehead of the glacier. We have lateral moraines, where the deposits are deposited on the side of the glacier. And finally, um, uh, the, the gears moraine, which are in two crevices. The moraines may be permeable, but uh, where fine grain has been transported further downstream by the, the meltwater. Here is an example of uh, escales. So an escale is an elongated senior scorn, uh, which is mainly composed of sand, gravel, and uh, can spread up to several tens of kilometers long. The example here on the right is within the Abitibi Temiskaming Eska, which is well known for its uh, filtering the water, um, the bottom water for Eska. So at the top, you have the aerial view of the Eska, and at the bottom, you have the section view of the material within the Eska. So the result of the deposition of these sediments uh, is like tunnels which are dug by the evacuation of the meltwater from the glacier. Um, it has a high permeability and it uh, significant, is, is a significant aquifer potential. Here we have an example of kettles. The, the picture shows the Metabachuan Lake in Lac Saint-Jean. Kettles are mainly depressions in a bowl. Uh, left uh, in a glacial or a glacial fluvial deposit. So um, they result from the collapse of the sediments following the melting of a large block of ice, which is trapped under the deposits of sand and gravel. The displaced sediments then form a funnel like depression. So they're called kettles. So the, oppos the opposite of kettles are known as cans because they will build irregular uh, hills made up uh, mainly of sand and gravels. So they're just an accumulation of sediments mobilized by super uh, glacial rivers in a depression on the surface. And these can make good aquifers when they are thick enough. Deep sea and glacial uh, lacustrine sediments are known as clays and silts. So um, these are found, as we see this picture here, they're called rhythmids. It's just that there's um, an alternate between clays and silts. These layers mark sedimentation between different uh, rhythm, rhythm of the seasons. So mainly uh, during the spring, when we have stronger currents, uh, these currents can transport coarser material. And in the winter, when we have calmer waters, uh, they deposit the finest particles. So the, this, the sequence of these two layers, they will illustrate what is, what is called a year sedimentation or what is called a varve. And uh, the silts are not very uh, permeable. Uh, for the shallow water sediments, what we find uh, in the delta sands or on the coasts, um, they're mainly sediments accumulated in uh, raised uh, temporary marine bodies and when as the Champlain Sea is um, uh, 
going away, the lack of sufficient current to keep them in suspension thus forms the deltas. These deposits now form large aquifers. So example here, sands are, very, are permeable deposits that were placed on the edge of the beaches of the era and uh, during the uh, advent of the glaciation. In shallow water, they can constitute good aquifers uh, when they are thick enough. Uh, the example of wind sediments is uh, seen here in the dunes, as we see the, the dunes of the uh, Magdalen Islands in Quebec. So they're mainly discovered by their retreat of ice and water. Um, the surface deposits are uh, subject to action of intense winds, which can change their morphology all the time. So these winds deposits can be good aquifers. The alluvium sediments or alluvium um, are mainly material transported by watercourses and deposited where the current uh, becomes weak and they form what we call the alluvial plain of rivers and they're mainly composed of uh, various grain sizes, uh, clay and gravel. They also constitute uh, aquifers when the materials are sufficiently coarse. And finally, the organic sediments or deposits uh, within wetlands. So these are sites that have been saturated water or flooded for a long period and they uh, influence the vegetation and the substrate. So they play an important role in the hydrological cycle of watershed and they're very important in the recharge and discharge processes of groundwaters. Um, in Quebec, the wetlands are mainly made of peatlands um, and the lower layer is composed of decomposed organic material. It has a low permeability as the upper layer is composed of fresh organic material and it has a high permeable uh, value. As we see here, the rose peatland in, the, in central Quebec. And is there any questions? We give her a few minutes. Yeah. Just, oh, yeah. Just um, scroll down a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, actually, go over to uh, green, green tab. Yeah. So, yeah. Stop sharing. Stop sharing? Yeah. Yeah. We'll see you. Yeah. That's huh. good. We have that chat box on the right. And there's even a function if someone wants to raise their hand. Yeah. If they want to ask a question. Oh, thank you for interesting. Okay. I guess I'll be it. No questions at all? Okay. It was clear. <laughs> I guess so. I think we're good. Thank you for listening, for being there. <laughs>